Hi there. Welcome back to the Board Game Specialists. I'm Carla. And I'm Melanie. And today we are talking about our top nine farm-themed games. Yes. This is one of my favorite genres. Um, <laughs> it was a hard decision for me. I had so many to choose one from. What about you? Well, you know, I've, I've got some farm games definitely that I've played. Um, and then I had a lot that I had not played. And I was like, I, I need to get them played so I can, before I put my list together. And then I got a couple's played. Um, and they may or may not have made my list. Um, and then I got a couple played after I made my list. So I was like, well, whatever. <laughs> but it was, it's good. It's just a neat theme. Yeah, it's, it's so fun. And it was kind of what kind of got me into the hobby. Like when I first played, I think my first farm game was Caverna, maybe. And okay. That really got me into the worker placement and all that kind of stuff. So then I would search for more and more and more of of yeah. that. But, okay, before we talk about those games, let's talk about what we've been playing. Yeah. You've been playing up a storm. Yeah. Just I've like, got seven games off my shelf of Shane this past that's week. Awesome. Um, so that that just kind of happened. Well, because I ended up having two game night. Like, um, um was uh Kayla my friend Kayla was supposed to come over uh two weekends ago and it turned out didn't work out so I said well I'm off at two this week let's let's do an evening she's like Kate sounds good so we ended up doing a game night on Thursday and then Lee on like I think it was like Wednesday night we're sitting on the couch and he's like so what's the plan this weekend I was like I'm not sure it's wide open and he's like oh so you could play games and I'm like <laughs> You want to go ride your bike, don't you? <laughs> so, so then we ended up planning another game day the Saturdays. I had two game day. Uh, and you just got to play a bunch of games, which was great. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. That's so awesome. I'll get started about the games I've played. One of them, like, so first of all, I've been collecting the key series games. I have Key Flower. I love it. So I've been buying the Key Series game. And as I said, I was working and well, like I'm, I'm taking phone calls and stuff, but I had my phone kind of like in the background in between calls and stuff, just playing a tutorial. So I'm learning Key Flow and it looks so amazing. It's like a card game version uh, of this Key Series. And then depending on where you place the cards and all, it, it looks so cool. So I spent half the day learning Key Flow. And then I went to grab it so I could kind of look at it, the rules closer. And I don't own Key Flow. <laughs> I well, own... now you can easily get it because you know how to play. Yeah. Right? Well, it's been on my, I just haven't come across Key Flow yet, but I got Keeper, Key, uh, like Key Harvest, Key Market, Key uh, Key Flowers, Key the City, but I don't have Key Flow. So I was like, <laughs> oh, darn. So I was like, All right, well, let's learn Key Harvest. So I ended up playing Key Harvest and I played it by myself the first time where I'm controlling two players because it's not a solo game. And playing it by yourself, it, it helps to learn the rules for sure, but it really didn't give me a sense of the game. I had no idea what I thought of the game because the whole game is your it it has like a strong um chinatown or uh bunny kingdom feel to it cuz each player has a board that goes from like a1 to a7 and then b1 to b7 oh, and grid. so on and you start with two tiles that are separate from each other and you're trying to create these clusters um and each of the tiles is going to generate a different uh, good. So like you are building uh, a farm like, and this could have made my list, but I played it after I had made my list. So it'll be my honorable mention as well. We'll say, um, but you're trying to create these clusters and then you're gaining these goods and then you put these goods behind your little screen. So the other player kind of has an idea of what you might have, but they don't know for sure. Um, and then what happens? Cause if you want, like you got the main board that'll have, which location is available and it's like oh e2 that would connect to my e3 and then that would kind of build this cluster so that's good i'm going to try to go for that so on your turn you can bring it from the main board onto your store but you can't put on the store on the same turn you're going to have to do that next turn so the other player could come and buy 
those tiles from your store. So maybe I'm buying a mm-hmm. tile like, oh, A5. And Lee really needs A5. So I'm going to put this here. And because when you put it in your store, you also assign goods to it that puts the price on it. So if you're going to build it, you just dis- discard the goods and you've paid the price. But if the other player wants it, they have to pay the price you've put on it. So it's like, oh, Lee's really going to want this one. So I'm going to put this one here and I'm going to give it a big price, right? So either it makes it harder than if he wants it, then he has to pay the price and I get all those goods and then that comes back to me. So playing solo, you you don't get that in that because it's so it's so much interaction as to like, okay, was he gonna go for this? Is that you know, so um well, I played it again right after Withley and it is a really neat, interesting game. It plays completely different than Keyflower. Like it was so neat how yeah, it, it was a complete like different game from Keyflower. Um yeah. I mean similar artwork, similar theme, but it just had a complete different feel to it. So that was really cool. Um and then um yeah, so that was one that I, I ended up playing. Um, my friend Darren did point out it is not a colorblind friendly friendly game at all. Um, oh, really? There's no way of de- like because you know you've got all the goods; they're different colors. That's the only way you can tell them apart. So if you have colorblind issues, you won't be able to tell the goods apart. Are the goods cubes? Yeah. So if well, you, like they're not even you... like they're like octagons or whatever, but yeah, like they're little wooden bits. So they're not. So shaped. if you made them. Like substitute them for different things. I guess you could you know. substitute, but um, yeah, but you'd have to have a way to be able to know like what's what. Um, yeah, and I don't know well, that. Guess. Well, yeah. So oh, on the cards, on the cards as well. well um, and I that. think the cards has the image, so it could work. But yeah, mm-hmm. you'd have to modify the game if you wanted to. If you have color blindness issues, um, I have a few gamer friends where they are color blind. So that the key flower or the which one of the key harvest would would not be a good one for that? It must, the whole key series is the same. Yeah, part, so it might be similar. Yeah. I think like board games are becoming more conscientious of that, but yeah. back then they really mm-hmm. weren't. Um, yeah. So yeah, but that was the first one I played. The second one we ended up playing, also got it off the sh- uh, shelf of shame, was God of War, the card game. Lee bought this one at Princess Auto for me, which is a <laughs> like a mechanic store, like. So it was weird that they have board games there, but this is one that Lee and my stepson was like, "Ah, oh, God of War, what? So because it's based on the video game, so oh. we ended up playing it. Now, what was super cool about this is you like you have these different characters you can play as. Each character has their own set of cards that they'll they'll start with. Um and you know, and it's based on the character. So I ended up playing as like a head. So I'm not even like my own character. I'm a supporting character that the head gets attached to another character. Um, and apparently that's what it's like in a, in a video game. Um, but then you kind of play, like you shuffle these scenario cards and you kind of pull some out and you pick the scenario you're going to do. Um, and then you pull out the scenario card. And what's really cool about it is like you got these big like tarot sized cards. That's the scenario card. And it builds a scene. So like you put four on the top, four on the bottom and you creates like this whole image. So now you have, and that's your scenario. And on there, like every turn, you're going to flip a card over. That's going to have a symbol and the symbol could activate something on this in this scene and it's like, oh, it activates this. So you flip this over. So now, oh, the bad guy's kind of doing this now. Like, and as you're attacking the monsters in this scene, um, if you attack, like it, it could create different things, but this, the cards flip interacting, like, so you're interacting with the scene and the scene change as you're attacking or as different things happen. So it feels interactive and the story develops just by the way that these scenes flip and you go with like a, your level one scene. And then once you beat that, you go into your level two and then you have your big boss monster. Now this game is very difficult. Um, like we played it, I think a couple of times and I was playing as a different character and I just kept dying. And they're like, okay, maybe we need the head. So then that's when we brought the head plays a supportive role. Um, Cause 
I like with that as that one. I like I just helped, but it, at first I didn't realize that some of the cards, like the purple cards, could be played at any time, and the purple cards are the one that can heal you. So I wasn't healing myself until my turn would come, but I would die before my turn would come around. Like it's it's a it's a difficult game, um, which is a cooperative game, and I like my cooperative to be on the harder side, so not too easy. Um, but it was just so neat with the way that the scene works, and then like you have like it just felt so interactive with cards in a board game. So those were the two games. Well, what, some of the two games I've played this week. How about you? What have you been playing? Well, I've um, I've got Ashley now into Roll and Write. I know. So How did you? She's- <laughs> I think it was it's it's one of my games on my list, so I'm not going to say which one. I think was the one that might have done it. I'm trying to think what the first one that she was like, okay, maybe I do like Rolling Right. Um, she just didn't like what really turned her off was playing um, <clears throat> the dinosaur Roar and Right, where oh, you have okay. to draw everything and you map stuff out. I didn't like that one as well, but anyway, so um, she found this one. Well, it was kickstarted like months ago and I know I didn't back it because the shipping was so ridiculous. Oh. But I thought I'll just wait till it comes out and I get yeah. it. Anyway, it's called Flip Town. Okay. And this one is like a western themed one and you have two pages and but you use poker or you use a deck of cards instead of dice. Oh, so okay. It's cool because it's just a normal deck of cards but um and you flip three of them. And you're going to choose one of the cards for a poker hand. And you're going to like write down which one that is because you'll have five cards at the end of the round. And then the other two you're going to use to put on your board. So you're going to use one for the suit and the other for the number. So say I had like a king of hearts and I thought, okay, I'm going to take that king from my poker hand. And then I circle that one. And then I'll take the ace of spades and the ten of... um, Let's say clubs. So I could either do a spade 10 or a club ace. And then there's all different things on your board that you can do. Like each um, suit has a little spot that you can go to. And some will give you like ongoing bonuses throughout the game. Some you'll go in like... um, What's the other one? You go on this trail and you can go as far as you want, but you can never go back. So you okay. kind of want to go slowly, but you have to have the number high enough to go up to that spot. Um, there's like a little cemetery thing that you can go to and connect all these um, little bonuses that you'll get. But the neat thing too is that some of the really good things that you'll get give you some wanted. So it makes you being a wanted person, which is bad, but so you have to circle all the things that you get. You, you will get gold and you'll get money. But the thing is, then at the end of the round, you have to decide if you're going to gamble. Like, say I have six wanted. There's a card put off to the side and we're going to flip it up. If it's lower than six, then I'm going to be arrested. And I can't remember what happens there because I never it never happened to me. I always paid it off. Mm. But you could pay it off in gold. If you have enough gold and then you can, um, you don't have to worry about the card. There's ways of getting rid of your wanted on there. Um, there's stars, which is the main points, and there's a whole bunch of ways to get those points. But it's a really neat little combo game that with the theme adds a lot. And the cards are really neat. It's different than, you know, just flipping a, a, a different card that and you decide what to do with that. This way you have three to choose from and you get to do that. And then at the end of the round two, at the end of five rounds, sorry, you'll have a full poker hand. And then depending what you have, like pairs, uh, two pairs, three of a kind, all that, then you get um, certain stars and bonuses off that. So it's coming out soon. I think it's it's um, coming to backers right away. So it shouldn't be too long before it's out. But it's a really, really good one. One of the oh, cool. best ones, I would say. Um, and then another one I, I've been trying to buy for a while, and this is just a little like 20 minute game. It's called Downtown Farmer's Market. Okay. This one is just a little puzzle game where you shuffle out um, eight tiles and they're like scoring tiles. And then you're going to put them four down and four across. So they're like in a grid and each of you have your own and they're all different. So you don't have the same scoring tiles. And then you're going to just draft these um, market tiles in the front. So these tiles on the top and bottom of your grid are either going to say like, um, this one wants like four carrots only and no more than four. This one wants two milk and one cheese. 
And this one will give you one point for all of your bread. So you're putting them in this grid and you're trying to satisfy all of those goals without screwing up any of the other ones. And it's just, it's like just a simple game, but it's, as soon as you start playing, you're like, oh, this is easy. I can do this. Then as you get them filled in a little bit more, you're like, oh shoot, now I have to draft one of those because in a two player game, there's five tiles in the market You'll take one and then take one away from the other person. In a three-player game, only the first player will get to take one away. So you can kind of hate draft a bit because you're like, oh, you would love that three cheese right now, wouldn't you? Because you get one point for each of those. But then they might have made themselves a spot where they can't even put that down because there's another tile that says it doesn't want any cheese there or something in that part of the grid. It's really like a cool little thinky game, but... It's quite addicting and it's fun. And that's Downtown Farmer's Market. Nice. Those were a couple of the ones I played. Um, so let's get to our list. Yes. What is your top nine or do you have any honorable mentions? <laughs> um, you know, while I'm just looking at my list, I I mean, it's I'm like, oh, but that's a good game. Oh, but that was a good game. And oh, oh that was a good game. So, I mean, they, they can only be so many in the top nine. Um, yeah. I'll leave my other one and see if they show up in yours. Um, my my number ten, the card version is later in my list, so we'll we'll leave it like that. Oh, okay. But for my number nine, I have Bonanza. Bonanza was created in 1997 by Eurozenberg, and I just this this is just it's a card game, and for a simple card game, it's just so good. This is such a great game. Um, Everybody gets a hand of card and you can't shuffle. And it all has these whimsical character that are different beans. You got the black eye bean, that's the boxer. You know, you got the long stringy wax bean that's washing floors and different things like that. So it's the artwork is funny and whimsical. And you have your hand of cards and on your turn, you're going to have to plant the one that is in the front. You can't sort your card and it needs to go into your field. At first, it's fine. You've got two spots in your field that has nothing. So be okay. Well, I'm going to plant that one here. And if you're lucky, you got a few in a row so you can plant multiple because you can plant as many as you want but you only have the two spots and you can't mix the beans so if you have a black eye bean it's going to have to be a black eye bean and then so you're putting the card down and then afterwards once you're done planting your two beans you flip two in front of you and then you're trading these so either you're going to plant them or you trade with the other players so this is really a trading game it says okay well I've Okay, well, I got a coffee bean, and I don't have any coffee beans in my hands. So I kind of don't want to plant that right now. Who would like a coffee bean to plant? And then somebody else might have a coffee bean that's coming up in their hands. So like, yeah, I'll take your coffee bean. So, okay, well, what are you giving me for it? Do you have any black eye beans? And, you know, so you start negotiating the trading, and you're trying to make it so that you can remove cards from your hand that's kind of in the way of creating the cluster so that you can plant multiples in a row or kind of removing beans that you don't really have that you don't want to to uh, plant. Now, if on your turn, you like I mentioned, you have to plant. If you weren't able to get rid of a bean that you didn't really want to keep, it's like, great, well, I didn't want to have a blue bean, but I have a blue bean now because nobody traded, then you're going to have to harvest what's already there to make space to plant your blue bean because you have to plant on your turn, right? Um, and then all of the ones have like a, like a thing on the back. So have like a multiple cards for a one coin and multiple cards for two coins and so on. So depending on the bean, some is like, okay, if you have two cards, it's worth one coin. Three is worth two. So like they ramp up quick. But some of them is like, well, you need to have seven cards before it gives you one. And like, so you got some beans that are more rare than others. And then that have more in the deck than others. And then when you keep them, it's like, okay, well, I'm harvesting these ones. That's where two coins so you're going to take two of those cards put them face down because the back of them is the coins and the other ones get in the discard pile and the game plays through the discard pile two times um, and then the first round takes like a long time the second round goes faster because a bunch of cards are pulled out in our coins now and then the third round is super quick and then it's whoever has the most money is the winner um, it's just a simple game but it's so well made like it's such a great game that's my number nine bonanza yeah, that is such a good game. I don't get to play it because I don't have people that like it around me, but oh, they weird. are, they did make another version. It's called, uh, it's just coming out. 
It's the same game, but they're using flowers. I think it's called Dahlia or something. Oh, I did see that. Yeah, yeah kind of a cuter same. theme, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it'll appeal to more people. I like the beans, but... Yeah. Anyway, all right. So I have one honorable mention just because um, I've only got to play it a couple times and I could never track down a copy because it's out of print, but now they are reprinting it. And that's called Scoville. Oh, now, this nice. one is a pepper farming game. And it's so unique how you play this because you have to like fulfill like recipes kind of thing. But how you gather your peppers is you have this little grid and they're <clears throat> all these different colored peppers are planted like in so they're wooden meeples and you move your farmer around and you have to move him in certain ways like he can't go backwards and it's it's quite interesting I haven't played it for so long but the peppers there's all kinds of peppers there's like ghost peppers red peppers and all kinds of things it's just such a unique game that I've never played anything like it but it's coming back out in print so you guys should try it it's awesome but nice. my number nine is oh, right. a that's roll and write. That's What's your number yeah, nine? Yeah, that was number. It's an it's a roll and write, and I oh. think this is the one that maybe had gotten my friend Ashley into uh, our friend Ashley into roll and writes now, and that's called Three Sisters, and it's uh, designed by. I always get these two mixed up. Yeah, it's Ben Pinchback and Matt Riddle. I sometimes say Ben Riddle and Matt <laughs> Pinchback. So these two make a variety of games, not just roll and writes. They make all kinds of different games, and they're I just love their designs. But this one is awesome. You are farming um, pumpkins, beans, and um, also perennials and fruits. But how you do this is you have this garden page that has – six different um, groupings and then at the bottom you have all your perennials and then on the right side you have this whole shed that has different tools that will either give you points at the end or give you some ongoing bonuses you have some fruit that you can harvest and then you have an a pyre. I always say this wrong but like where you can grow beehives and, and different oh, things okay. so and you draft dice, what you do. So you have this board that you're going to draft this dice from. And you'll roll, I think it's five or six dice. I can't remember how many. And you'll put them in order of like smaller to greater around this like rondelle kind of thing. And you have this farmer, Edith, I think her name is. And she is she starts on this one spot. And then you always put the dice after her. And then you're just going to each draft a dice. So you whatever you draft the number, that's the... Um, the part of the garden where you're going to either plant or water. So if you plant, you can plant two plants. And so you always start at the bottom of each plant and you, you will just put an X in. Now, if you were to water that area, you'd get to water everything that you planted in there. So at the beginning, you don't have anything planted. So you're going to plant. Um, and then you're also going to take the action that it's on. So it's on this rendell there, Rondell, there's all kinds of actions. So you might have a shed action. So you'll get to cross off something in your shed. Now there's this seed spreader. If you can fill that up, then every time you plant, you can plant three instead of two. So that's always the first thing I go for because then the planting is just that much better. Um, there's different things like a farmer's market. Depending on how many goods you have, you're going to get to have get better things. And goods are um, things that you'll cross off from other things. But once you get to your fifth one, you always get a free X that you can cross off anywhere other than the garden. So it's always like some turns are like, oh, this is giving me this. And then this gives me that. And then that gives me this up here. And then I go back here. This this little notepad has a thing for notes because sometimes you're like, <laughs> okay, I got a free one here. I got a mark in here. And then you're like, so you mark down, okay, I got this, this, and this so that you can remember because some of your turns are just so crazy that you need to take notes. That's <laughs> I just funny. love that they put notes. But it's awesome because in between, in the garden, in between all these six um, plants that you can plant, it's corn and beans and pumpkin. That's what it is. So apparently, and this is like an indigenous way of growing corn and beans together, like they grow fantastic beside each other apparently and then but in between all of them there's these um pumpkin that plants that you can plant and as soon as you um connect them all then you get to like 
um, get a perennial in between each one. So you're kind of trying to get all around that grid or that that whole garden, but you want to plant everything else. And the beans you can't plant until you have the corn up a certain height. So oh. it's all kind of, I, apparently it's all makes sense in real life. Like that's actually how you, the best way of planting all these things. But it's just a, a, such a neat thematic role, and right? That like everything you're doing makes sense. Like you're growing these um, perennials and then once you get up to a certain amount, you get points or whatever, but those growing up, these perennials will help you harvest fruit. And it's just a really cool role, right? They have a whole series. They had started with um, Fleet the Dice Game and then Mm -hmm. there was this one and then they did Motor City, which actually we just played is really cool. And then they have a new one coming out, French Quarter. I think it's just... Um, just finished on Kickstarter not too long ago, but they have a knack for just making these such good roll and rights. And they make other games as well that are all different and unique, but Mm -hmm. really good designers. But that is my number nine, Three Sisters. Nice. My number eight is Cacao, uh, created in 2015 by Phil Walker Harding. And this one is like you're in a like your chocolate plantation or whatever, and you're, you're growing these cacao um, seeds or harvesting these cacao seeds. And what's really interesting with it is like each player has their own little round player board. You have like, you keep track of your score and stuff on there. Um, And then you have like, you can hold up to, is it five or six cacao? So they have like these little wooden seeds that you can put on there as you collect. And, you have the main board that you're going to be playing on and each player has a set of tiles that's village tiles. So you have the village tiles in the color of each player that are playing. And then you have the like plantation uh, tiles that's going to go in between and you create a grid. So it's going to be like a checker grid where it's going to be village plantation, village plantation, village plantation. And then depending on where everything gets put, but what's really interesting with it is like your village tiles has a little like village hut in the middle and then you have four meeples on it. So depending on the tile, if you have like maybe one meeple on each side or maybe you have like two and two or maybe you have like one and one and two or you have three and one. And so it's all divided up uh, along the four edges of your village tile in different ways. And but this is also how you activate the action. So it's like, okay, well, I'm going to place this village tile here, which is a three meeple on this side and a one meeple on this side. So I'm attaching the three meeple onto this uh, cacao plantation here that has like the one plantation. So that means I get to collect three seeds because of my three meeples. I activate it three times. So you take the three seeds and you hold them. And then the one that's touching over here, well, that one's touching the market where I can go and sell at a certain price. I'm going to sell one of them because there's only the one meeple. If there was more meeples, you'd be able to activate it more. And then you get the money for it. And then the next player goes, I, okay, well, you've just put the three one. So that means the two other sides are zero. Well, I'm going to put this gold mine attached over here which is connecting to your no meeple side so you don't get to activate it um but if i had a meeple showing there and they had played the tile then my meeple would activate that action so it's it has a really interesting decision as to what you're trying to activate by where you how you place your village tile and where you're going to put the plantation tile so that the other players don't get to activate what you're playing if you can avoid it. Um, and it's just a very interesting uh, like concept to it. Now, I haven't really come across anything that plays quite that way, um, but it's, uh, it's a neat game. It's super fun. And that's my number eight, Cacao. It's an awesome game. I actually didn't even have it on my list to pick for this. I can't believe I didn't. <gasps> it's such a good game. I want to play it right now. I <laughs> play it. I've played it on Board Game Arena. Yeah. But I actually hate playing tile games on there oh, okay. because you have to like move your screen around and make oh. it bigger and smaller. And my I am so not. Yeah. I'm not in depth with that because I make it too small. I can't see it. Then I make it too big and I can't see it. 
And you have yeah. to move it. Like when I play a tile game, which I love, I love my tile games. I want it all in front of me so yeah. I can see everything. But it is such an awesome game. And you're right. It's unique. I've never seen anything like with that worker, like how you place right. those workers. And you can overbuild them, which is really cool too at That's the end. That's true, if you right? you have those um, sunbeam things or something. Yeah. Yeah. Which makes it really interesting because you're, you think you've got the game and then somebody overbuilds and gets like a ton of like bean, um, co- cacao and uh, points and water. And oh yeah, it's, it's a really cool game. Good pick. All right. <laughs> my number eight is now this designer. I have one, two, three, four, <laughs> five games on my list. Can I think you take I know a guess the, the designer. Is? Yeah, I think I know. He's been it's, on my uh, list already. Yeah. Yeah, yes, he has been. <laughs> so it's U- Uwe Rosenberg. Now, this one is, I believe, one of his newest farming games, if not the newest, and that's Attawa, made in 2022. So this is about farming, but it's also, it's based on bats. So what he has researched is in um, Ghana, I'm going to say, I think that's where it is. They ha- are so overcome with bats that a lot of them think of them as evil and they are so scared of them and just kill them if they see them. When in actuality, they are very beneficial, which every animal and bug, believe it or not, is on this earth. We just don't always know what their, you know, positives are. <laughs> but what with bats, what they do is they... They were so worried because they'd eat all their fruit trees. And they're like, they're d- killing all our fruit trees. But what they're actually doing is they eat them. Then they fly away carrying the seed with them. And then when they poop it out, they actually are planting more fruit. So for them to eat one and plant, I don't know how many, but it actually spreads it around. And it can they can also spread it around right there. So once they figured this out, they started to welcoming the bats. And so in the game, it's really cool because you start with this little village. You have one card that has a grid of different things on it. Like it'll have maybe a tree, um, some an animal, um, and then spots for some bats. And so what you're trying to do is you're trying to obviously get the most points. But how you do that is everybody has a card in front of them and they have um, trees on them. They have fruit, um, animals, and animals, I'm going to say it's goats, I believe. And so depending what you do, it's a worker placement game, and you have all these spots that will change every round because you slide this one card over, and you will place a worker and get to do some action. So you may get to um, plant a tree, which will give you another piece of fruit. You may get to... um, build a whole other card in the village, which will give you more spots to do everything. You may get to have a new family. And it's funny because the families come untrained. So they think the bats are bad. So at the end of the round, when you're feeding your people, normally you can only feed them like milk and food. But if you have untrained families, you can also feed them the bats. (laughs) But then you get some like negatives for that. But once you train them, then um, you don't feed them bats. But you do get a a gold every time you have a trained family. If you don't have a trained family, you get to pan for gold and you may get it, but you may not. It's quite a unique farming game of his because of how everything works and how you're taking stuff off your board. Because once you take stuff off your board, at the end, when you kind of do income, you get more things. And when you go from top to bottom, you might take something off the top, which gives you more of the stuff down here. Or sometimes you might have to put stuff back on, which gives you less. So it's quite a unique game. And it's so cool. And I will play this one anytime. I'm so glad I got this. And that's my number eight, Attawa. Nice. Yeah, I haven't played that one yet, but heard lots of good stuff about it, so that's cool. Um, My number seven is one that I've talked about many times, and that's Happy Pigs. Happy Pigs was created in 2013 by Kuraki Mura, and it's about raising pigs. And first of all, like, it's so cutesy. All the pigs are, like, cube-like. It's, like, almost Minecraft (laughs) pigs or whatever, so they all have this, like... Oh, yeah shape to them Mm -hmm. um and you're going to be raising pigs so it starts by you're setting up the the tiles or the big cards because it goes spring summer fall winter spring summer fall winter and you play a few years so each year is around um but 
So you're going to start with the spring. So you flip the spring card and you don't know what's going to be on there, but it's going to have like each one has a special thing going on. So it could be like, oh, there's a sale on pigs. So if you're going to buy pigs, instead of having to pay like $10 for this size pig, you actually pay seven. So which is good because the whole goal of the game is to have the most money at the end of the game. And you're getting that by buying and selling pigs. So be like, oh, okay, well, this is a good time to buy pigs because they're, they're cheaper. Um, but because otherwise there's a set price to them. So if you're going to buy and sell pigs, like, oh, I'm going to just buy a bunch of pigs and then I'll sell them at the end. You're going to buy them and sell them for the same price. So it's, it's not going to work out that way. You need to buy the pigs because if you have two large pig or the largest pigs, they can breed. So you can do the breeding action as well. And then you bring in piglets and then you're going to feed them to grow them bigger so that they're worth more. And then you can sell your bigger pigs for a higher price. So that's how you're going to make the money is by raising the pigs. Um, but what's really interesting with this game is the action uh, part of the game because each time you flip a tile, it's going to tell you what's available for action. It's like, okay, so there's nine feet action and there's five market action and there's four sell action and there's uh you know maybe seven breed actions okay and then you have your tile that has like the action and you pick which action you want to do say well i'm gonna feed my pigs this time so that i can because each time you feed your pig they grow the next size up so i'm gonna (laughs) i'm gonna feed them so and then you're like okay and then everybody flips over now, if I'm the only one who did the feed action, I get the whole nine uh, pick the feed action. Then I get to do it nine times if I can. You can only feed your pig once. Um, but if everybody that's playing pick the, the feed action, and let's say there's four of us, so then that means we need to divide the nine between four of us. And whoever's first player gets to have the action first, so they would ha- get to do it more. One person would get, you know, like, um, so that one would get three and everybody else would get two. So then you're like, oh, God, I was really hoping to be able to feed all four of my pigs. Now I only get to feed two. Okay. Like, and, you know, so that action selection is really interesting. It's like, okay, well, I don't think he's going to feed his pigs. So I'm going to go to the, you know, it's like you kind of trying to, do an action so you get to activate it a lot um also you like these pigs are double-sided then there's one side where they have a little band-aid on because they've been vaccinated (laughs) because you need to vaccinate your kids uh your pig your kids your 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 pigs because otherwise they won't survive the winter and then if you don't sell them and they're not vaccinated at when the winter tile comes over they all die and it just go go away um, and you can buy more field because you they have to fit in the pig pen, but you can buy more land so that you can fit more. And then you like Tetris them in there trying to fit as many pigs as you can. It is just such a neat economic game. Um, and to look at it, it looks so cutesy and light almost, but this is a nice, robust economic game. And that's my number seven, Happy Pigs. I want to play this one so bad. I've never played it. Yeah, um, we got to play it. We have to play it with Cherry. She loves economic games. Oh, she yeah. this game. Yeah. This one might be a good gift game for her, actually. Hmm. hmm. Cherry, don't listen to this part. Yeah. Act surprise. She, I don't think she does. She's too busy now. Uh, so, haha. Ashley, don't get it for her. I'm going to get it. No. <laughs> All right. Awesome. My number seven is... Um, another Uwe Rosenberg, and this is At the Gates of Lo Yang, made in 2009. Mm. Now, this one is another unique one of his, where you are um, harvesting and planting veggies. And how you do it is so unique, because you start with this one little garden, and it'll have, like, say, maybe only cabbage on it, or it'll only have asparagus, or it'll only have wheat. It's only, like, one one thing has only one type of of crop so in the first round you start with one crop i can't remember if it's all the same crop i haven't played it for a while but and then what you're doing is you're drafting cards from this middle and some of these cards could be other crops that you can take some will be helpers Um, Some will be customers that you're going to try and fulfill with different things. You do start with one of almost every veggie on in your little market. 
So you can satisfy some people even the first round. But these customers are either, um, I can't remember how they name them. They're either like um, just temporary customers where it's a one-time fill or they need to, you need to fill them every round. Now, the ones you need to fill every round, if you don't fill it, they start to get angry. So if you miss it one round, then you flip this little thing over and they're kind of angry. And they kind of stay angry. And, and, and if you don't fulfill it, you get some sort of really bad negative. But once they're na- they're angry, it's really hard, hard to keep them happy or to f- get it flipped over. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a, all different kinds of cards that you draft, but you only draft so many. And so then, and you have this little player board in front of you, which is like a tree. It feels like how it's shaped. And so it's got like this narrow bottom and then it kind of branch or like flows out into a big thing and that's where your veggies are but on the sides of the tree I'm going to say tree it's only shaped like that is um the stem is all the points that you're going up and this one is just a race like there's no end game points so you don't score anything you are just trying to get the first one to get to a certain amount depending on player count 16 stands out in my mind for a two player so the first one there is the winner and that's it and I think if it's um like if we, we played a two player and I was the first player and got there, I think you have one chance to get there, but that's it. So you have spots on each side of your like stem where you can put your veggies. Cause then you have little cards that have little market stands. And then you have your um, customers on the right. And then on the bottom are like helpers. And so these cards have to be played in a certain order too. So you might have put some cards on the bottom that aren't available yet until you've used the top of the cards. So it's very puzzly because you have to kind of plan everything out. Um, it never works out perfect. Like you can never fulfill every single thing that you have. So you have to figure out which is the best to fulfill the customers, um, flipping your markets over. It's so much thinking but it's such a unique game and this one was remade this one did go out of print i had got it before or i i think i'd got it used from somewhere and then they did bring it back back into print but it's not talked about very much no you barely ever hear about this one but it's really cool and that's my number seven at the gates of Lu- Lo yang nice yeah all right my number six is one that made it off the shelf of shame this week um, oh, and nice. that's the one that's the card game version of the board game version, which would have been my number 10. So my number six is San Juan, uh, created in 2014. I have, well, 2014, cause I have the second edition one. Uh, and it was created by Andrea's Seafarth. And this is Puerto Rico, the card game, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was so impressed with this. Now I've played recently a couple of like, um, I played Innovation, the card game, which is like a civilization card game. And this has a very similar feel to it, but it's not civilization. You're building like your, the, you know, so it's more like farming because you're building these things. So it's not technology per se. Um, but what's neat is like the Puerto Rico, you have the different action car- tiles that's in the middle and you take turn activating the actions I, okay well i'm gonna do this action so because you're doing it you get to do the action and you get the little bit bo- of extra bonus to it and then everybody else also gets to do that action as well so it's like okay i'm gonna build um and i get to build at a discount of one because i got the i'm the one activating the build action and everybody else gets to build but they got to pay full price and all of your cards have the price and it's neat because the cards you have in your hand are the buildings you can build but they're also the money so it's like okay well i really want to build this one so that i can start planting indigo um but if i use the indigo like i I need this then that means i need to discard these cards in order to play for it because it costs let's say cost two so i got to discard these well i don't want to really discard this one because later on if i can build this this would be really good so what else do i have like and and so the cards you're collecting, you have those decisions to make, like, what are you going to try to build to add into your tableau? And what are you discarding to pay for those things? So, cause it's the multi-use cards with these. Um, and then, so 
so let's say, okay, I discard that. I have indigo now. And then the next person does um, the harvesting or whatever. So it's like, oh, okay, great. So I can bring in crops. So then you're going to take a card from the draw deck and you just put it face down and that's your, your crop. And so you don't know what's on the backside of it. You know, like it's a super cool multi-use card mm -hmm. game. Like, cause the Very card cool. does everything. Um, and then is that, like, okay, so this one is there, but that's my crop set. Okay, well then I'm going to go to the market and then I'm selling it. And then you have these tiles that kind of flips over and shows you how much everything's going to be worth each time. So you don't, is that like, okay. Well, I know like coffee could, could bring in more say oh but it only brings one this time okay so then you discard it and then you draw a new card and it goes in your hand so you get the new card in your hand that you could try to either spend for money or you could try to build into your tableau and i think it's first person to build 10 or 12 cards that triggers the end but then there's like the um kind of engine building as well because I okay well I've got this crop here I got this crop here but I'm going to build this one which allows me to build an extra crop when I do the crop action on top of like if I'm the active player then I would actually get to do two extra like so it is so interesting all the decision that you're making kind of deciding what to keep what to what to build what's going to work with each other which action you're going to activate and it's neat I was so impressed with this one so impressed with this one um, I think given the chance, I would probably play this over Puerto Rico. That's why it's higher on my list, just because it's so easy to get going and it's so interesting. And the Puerto Rico, I do enjoy this game with a kind of, cause it's more, I guess, tactile. You have like your player board that you're building stuff on. Um, with San Juan, like, like with Puerto Rico, you have the board that has all the buildings that you're going to try to add to your own board with this one is it's all in the cards and you don't know what you're going to see, what's going to go. And you know, so, so satisfying. That's my number six San Juan. No, oh, that's a good one. I love that game. It's so clever how they designed it from mm -hmm. the big game. I like the big game too, but I think this would come out more if I yeah. had people who liked it. Cause I love this game. It's uh it's awesome. And the multi-use cards, so clever how they do that. Good choice. All right. My number six is Caverna made in 2013 by Uwe Rosenberg. This one, like I said at the beginning was probably what brought me into farming games. Um, I played this the first time and I was like, what? We get to build farms and fences and do all this little thing. Um, and then I kind of looked into uh, all his other ones and then, which is weird, just like about a year or two ago, I got into Agricola, which I had played early on, but it was so scary because it's so hard to feed people. <laughs> um, but it's, there's ways now that I've, that you can figure out it's not as hard as it seems, but Caverna has an easier route to feeding people and doesn't make it as scary. And it has so many other things you can do. It's a huge worker placement game with tons of spots that you can go to. And you're not just farming um, animals and food. You are also mining in your um, caves and you are building things in your caves. You're trying to make um, ruby mines and all kinds of things. So there's kind of two different things going on. You can kind of focus on one and not too much on the other, but you can't completely leave one thing out. You also have your workers that you can level them up as... Um, uh, Oh, I can't remember what it's called, but they, they get weapons. And every time you do use your weapon, it goes up. Like you keep getting better and better. And each time you have a higher weapon, you'll get more things when you explore. It's, it's so neat. The worker placement spots are cool. Now you go to, you also need to grow your family. I shouldn't say need to, you don't have to, but it helps because then you get more workers to place out. And then the harvest is only every couple rounds, so you don't have to feed every round, but you have to feed and then you get to breed and you get to pull off some of your veggies, which I thought was the coolest thing ever, which I'd never seen in a game is when you plant your wheat or pumpkins, well, you plant one, but then you put two more on and then so because it grows to three and then you get to pull that off when you harvest. I thought that was the coolest thing ever, but it, it does happen in a lot of other games I realized but the first time I seen it I just thought it was so cool the breeding is so funny just typical Uwe Rosenberg doesn't matter if you have five sheep you're only getting one when you breed you don't get to get 
pairs each make a baby. They just all make one, <laughs> which is funny, but it would make sense. It would be too many animals in there. I usually go the animal route in this game. I you like I do win a lot. I don't know if that's the only way to go, but I haven't changed it up because I do usually get first or second in this one. So I should try other um, ways to victory. But the animals are awesome because they are big points at the end too. And in both this one and Agricola, I believe if you are missing an animal, you get negative points. So mm-hmm. you don't just focus on one type. You need to get at least a few of each animal. The more you have of each, the the higher the points. And you can also use them for food if you need to. There's rubies in this, which is a wild resource, which is awesome because it can be used as almost anything. So in case you need to feed something or you need money, um, it can be used, which is really cool. If you get some ruby mines going, it's like you're getting just free wild stuff every kind of round. And just how you're, you're using the worker placement, like if you go to a spot, um, or if someone doesn't go to that spot that round, a lot of them will add more resources. So they just get juicier and juicier each round. And then they just build up with wood or rubies or stone and all kinds of things. And it's just an awesome game. I love it. And that's my number six, Caverna. Nice. My number five follows with your number six really well, because my number five is Agricola. Uh, oh, that nice. one was created in 2007 by Uwe Rosenberg. And I've never played Caverna, so I've only played Agricola. Ooh. I got Agricola really early on when I got into board games. And I remember it was me and my girlfriend came over and we sat down and we opened the book, rule book and we're like, Whoa, oh my God. And it was such a beast to learn because that was like our first bigger game, right? Like it was just getting into the 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 hobby um but it was so satisfying and then both of us at the time were living on farms you know so it was just a theme that appeals like okay and what's neat is like you have your player board you have your farmstead so you have like the little building that's where you're living and then you have like some croplands where you're going to be building crops but then you also have over here a field where you're going to need to put fences and let me tell you farming is all about the fencing <laughs> when you have animals so like and like okay well and then you can't move the fence so you got to be really say okay well i'm gonna put fence here because you got limited fence as well and create the different pen for the different animal uh and the vegetable that you bring in and what's really neat because this is a worker placement game and you have so many workers you start with but each round a new card kind of gets split or kind of gets flipped over giving you a new ability of what you can do uh, and it's like okay well now we have like a second fishing spot so there's other ways to get food and after a certain amount of round then every few rounds you have to feed your people um i've only played this game two players and i think because of that the feeding hasn't really been an issue because there's a few spots you can go and activate to get food to make sure you can feed your people. I would imagine if you have more players, that would be harder to get to, um, which probably would make this game feel a little bit trickier. Um, and then you got like the card drafting things where you're trying to get cards that'll give you abilities uh, to do different things. It is just a really neat game and it looks really good because you got the main board with like the different action that becomes available as you play you've got your little farmstead that you build and then all the meeples um that you have like you got all the little animal shaped wooden bits that you put on there and then you have all your vegetable shaped bits that you put on your like it's so beautiful and satisfying to look at um i also have agricola uh, all creatures big and small which is a kind of a faster version of agricola to me like it gives you that agricola feel it's a little bit faster you don't have the card uh aspect of it but it still has that agricola feel um i would play one or two the other this is one that when i played it with jerome my oldest um he really liked it and I was surprised that he would enjoy it so much. But, you know, he's a farm boy. This is a theme he knows like this. <laughs> so he's like, ah, oh, I like this one just because it was like you're farming. So it does have like this is one that really fits the theme well with this one. Like that's what you're doing. This is you are you have a farm and you're running your farm. So it's neat. That's my number five, Agricola. 
Yeah, the two-player version, like you said, is really good too. Uh, it just takes out the card play, basically, but you feel like you're playing a mini game of it, which is oh. awesome. Good choice. All right, my number five is Clans of Caledonia, made in 2017 by Juma El Juju. He's finally coming out with an expansion for this. Just like recently. So this is like a six-year-old game <laughs> that everybody's been waiting patiently for this expansion that he's talked about for years. But in this game, you are farming animals and crops again, but in a different way. Um, there's You each have a board with all your animals and crops, um, the, the meeples on them. None of them are planted yet. And you start with some workers out on the board. And what it is, is you are in, I think we're in Scotland, and you are putting out um, lumberjacks and mountain people. And they will, you're trying to connect all these different um, shipping routes for at the end of the game, whoever has the most connected shipping, or sorry, the mo yeah, they have to be connected by shipping routes, but you still want to have separate ones. So it includes your workers and factories. So you're either going to put out like a sheep factory, a cow factory, you can plant a wheat factory, and then those can turn into different things. So you can um, change your wheat factory when you're taking your kind of income. Um, you can either take, um, sorry, if it's a cow, you can either take the milk, or you could turn it into cheese, which is a better resource. Um, and then the wheat, you can either take two wheat or you could split it off. If you've built these, um, crops, you could either take a uh, whiskey or what's the other thing, bread. So it's kind of neat how you do it because you're trying to fulfill these little contracts too, which have all these different things on them. They might need, um, actual meat like beef or you might need bread or whiskey or whatever um, when you fulfill these contracts they give you something at the end and a lot of the times they'll give you these hops or they'll give you wool and stuff and that is what you move around this track for points so you're just increasing all these different resources at the end of the game those will score for and it's it's unique how they score because the most rarest one which would mean like say um, cotton was the least amount around the board, that would be the highest value. So on your contracts, whoever has that will get say five points per that they have. So that's a part of the scoring. Um, you're trying to always increase your shipping because then you can, when you're, placing your factories if you have no shipping you can only place it right next to each other but if you have like i can go across a lake then you can start i can have a cow here and i can put a worker or another cow over across the the lake once you have like five spaces you can really like spread out through the whole board and it's it's neat because if you plant next to somebody you get a bonus of buying a cheap whatever they have so say you i put um a factory next to someone who has a cow factory, then I can buy milk, uh, milk or cheese. I can't remember if it's both or just one for very cheap. Now there's this little sliding market too. So if it's not just about fulfilling the contracts. This market is ongoing because you will also use merchants to sell and buy things because that's sometimes the only way you can fill contracts. You can never like plant everything you need on a contract especially in the first few rounds. So you will go and buy, say something, and then that price of it will go up. And if you sell stuff, the price will go down. So it's interesting because you can see if somebody's planning to sell something, you might go there and drop the price a bit so they're not getting all this money. It's such a unique game, but it's such a cool farming theme. And I can't wait for the expansion, but that's my number five, Clans of Caledonia. Nice. Um, my number four is probably the most wide known farm game that got the most people into the hobby, and that's Catan. So Catan was created in 1995 by Klaus Tober. When I originally did my list, instead of Catan here, I had put Terra Mystica. Um, to me, Terra Mystica is like Catan 2.0. It takes it to the next level, makes it so cool. Like, and there's just so much going on to it. But it's not about farming anymore. It's about growing like this 
almost religion by building these temples and all that stuff. So it's really not about farming anymore when you go Terra Mystica. So while Catan is like you have your board of all these tiles, that's kind of, and it can generate that like differently every time, but so you have all these tiles on the board and each of these tiles represents one of five goods. Um, it could be wheat, it could be sheep, it could be clay or rock or forest. And those are the five goods that you have access to. Um, and you're going to be starting with two little village that you place where the, the lines connect. So if you put it on the corner, it's connecting to three of these tiles. And then so, uh, so you've got the two village out on there and you're going to take turn rolling the dice because each of these tiles also have a number associated with it between two to 12. So you're trying to get as close to S at eight or six as you can, because those are going to come up more often probability wise with the dice. So number seven obviously is the most likely, but number seven moves the robber, which kind of locks one of the tiles, making it that it doesn't produce anything. So you're going to roll the dice and be like, okay, well, we've rolled uh, a five. So then any tiles on the board that has a five will generate its product. So if you have a village attached to it, be like, oh, okay, great. I'm touching that. That's clay. So that means I get a clay. So you would draw a clay card and now you have this in your hand and you have like a list of recipes. Basically, if you want to build a road, it's going to be a clay and a wood to be able to build the road. So you're trying to collect that so you can create roads because you're trying to like each village is worth or settlement is worth one point. If you upgrade them into a city, that's going to cost you, is it three rocks and two wheat to do that? So if you upgrade it to a city, then it's going to be worth two victory points. Um, but And then you can go and build a new settlement, but that has to be two spaces away from any other settlement. So you got to build two roads to connect to it, first of all. Then you can go and add a new settlement, and the settlement's going to take a sheep, a wheat, a clay, and a and a uh, a wood in order to be able to build a new settlement off the you know so and I honestly I think Catan in our gaming community is getting a bit of a bad rep where people is like no I will not play Catan and that's because for so many people they have played it so much that they've just played it to death they're done they don't want to play it anymore but this is an amazing game it's so satisfying with the collecting the resource trading the resource to do the different things rolling the dice to see if you can activate what you need and then having like trying to get your stuff so probability is in your favor um you know it really sucks when the only rock you have access to is a two because the two almost never comes up, you know, so, but then you have the trading. Okay, well, that's okay. We can trade. And then you can trade with the other players and be like, okay, well, I would really like some rocks. Um, would you like some sheep? Like, no, I don't want sheep. Um, I'll take, I'll take a clay. It's like, oh, but clay's been really scarce and I need my clay as well. I don't want to <laughs> give you my clay, you know, so you can have these negotiation with the other players to trade, but then you can also build ports along the edge because the edge is water. And if you build a port, it's like, okay, well, I've built a port, which gives me access to a different trading. And this one, for every two woods uh, at this port, I can trade for any goods. Well, that's good because I've got like two tiles or two cities or whatever that's connected to wood. So I'm collecting lots of wood so I can go trade them two to one for stuff. You can always trade four to one, but then it's becoming pricey. Um, and then if the robber gets rolled and you have more than eight cards in your hand, then you lose half of them. So you're trying to keep tight uh, control of your resources so you're not losing them all but you have enough to do what you need to do the whole thing like when you teach somebody Catan it's it goes over well it's like oh my god this was an amazing game um, and Catan is an amazing game so that's my number four Catan awesome all right my number four is Howler Tau made by again Uwe Rosenberg in 2020 this one is another one of his farming games, but different again. You have a track and some fields beside it. So the track will track the value of what each of your crops is, but beside it are actual crops, which is cool because you're gonna, you start at the bottom and you're gonna move up to what level they're at. 
you have, I think there's about six that you can plant. And then it's once you, they've um, produced, they do move down just like in real farming where you have to like, um, like, is it like a year? Sometimes you have to just not plant anything to give it a break or something. But um, how you're getting everything is worker placement again. And it's different this time because you are just using cubes as workers, but they, depending on what you're trying to to do, if nobody's there, you just have to put one cube down and you'll get that action. And then somebody else can do it, but now they'll have to put two. Now, it's really neat because there's all different types of things you can do. You can plant crops, you can get cards. There's a real big part of this game is card play. And it will, the cards will give you income, they'll give you end game bonus, they'll give you on, on uh, going like um, player powers or whatnot that makes it so unique as well but the other thing you're trying to do is you're trying to move this community building on your player board so it starts in one spot and in it you can see um the end game points you would get if it was stuck there as you slide it over in the window it shows more and more points but in order to slide it over you have to fulfill all these little contracts beside it and you have to move these rocks so it's kind of neat because you need tools in order to move these rocks. You need all the resources and most of them are all different. So it's not like you can just have a whole bunch of one thing. You need a bunch of like some of everything in this one. So it's not like you can focus on one thing, but you're sliding this over and you're usually trying to get it right to the end, which is quite hard to do because you have to fulfill everything. Um, and you have to fulfill one whole row in order to slide it over. If you even miss one of them, then it won't move because the, the stone is still there. So it's, it's quite puzzly, but it's very unique as well. And that's my number four, Hallertau. Nice. My number three is Ceylon, uh, created in 2018 by Chris and Suzanne Zinsley. And so Ceylon basically is Sri Lanka before Sri Lanka got its name. And they used to have the, like they were big into coffee uh, producing, but then there was a mold that went through and kind of destroyed all of these coffee crops. So in order to kind of survive and save the economy, they converted all of these fields into tea crops, which apparently Sri Lanka is still now to this day, a big uh, tea distributor in the world. Um, but first of all, this board is amazing because you have these mm. four different areas. And then with the tea, depending on the elevation, what type of tea is going to grow at those locations. So you have the four section and then you have a tile that kind of creates that has like four of those I don't know, shape or space that's a second level. And then you add a third level to it. And that this is just kind of randomly put. And then, so you have these different elevation that's like base level, second level, third level. So base is going to be black tea. Second level is going to be your green tea. And then on the top elevation is going to be your white tea. And you have your player board and each player has a different colored tea leaves that has like these little wooden bits that fills in. And then as you start building your tea crops, depending on where you are, like you would put the crop tile and then you put your tea leaf to show that this one is yours. And depending on the elevation, what tea this is going to generate. And then you can go and then move your worker because this is work. Like you have a worker that moves on the map. So, okay, well, I'm going to move over here. So I'm near these tea plantation so i'm gonna harvest so i'm gonna get a uh, black tea for this one and i get uh, a green tea for my one there and then my the other player is there and i'm gonna go ahead and take a white tea from yours um but because i'm taking from yours it gives you a victory point but then now i have these for tea and you can hold up to five i think so now you have these tea crops that's in your hand and you can then go and activate the the action of um filling an order but when you fill the order that's interesting because each orders have like a number associated with it so let's say i fill an order that's a number three it's going to give me so much for filling it but then i have to put it face down on my board in the spot 
because there are so many spots that I could put my number three there. So if I fulfill another number three order, it goes on top of that. That's great. No problem. Now, if I fill another order and it's a number five on the card, well, I can't put it on top of the three. It needs to go in its own section. And I can't put it in its own section if I have a tea leaf there. I need to have freed up that space by having built tea uh, crops to open up another space for me to have these orders uh, things there. So that whole thing is really neat. What's really interesting though is when you're deciding what action you want to do because all the action you get to do is decided by the cards you have. So you have the cards and there's different actions you can do. Build a plantation, harvest, go fulfill an order or all these different things. But each card has two actions like, okay, well, I really want to build a plant, like go build a new tea, uh, tea crop. So I want to do this one, but this card has this action on the bottom. So there's a place where you place the action that you're going to do, but you could put the card facing up or facing down. You do the top action. Everybody else does the secondary action. So like, oh, I don't want them to harvest. They're like, <laughs> so hold on. Like, what else can I, I do? Like, okay, to I'm going to do this. <laughs> and it forces them to do that. And I know that he can't do it because he's not located at the right spot to do that. So mm -hmm. I'll do this action instead. And then the, every other player then can do the other action. Now, you always have the option of collecting money or moving instead of doing the action if you wanted to. And there's like, oh, I can't believe you played that card. I can't do this. I have, it's like, nice. I have no tea. Yeah. Yeah. Like fulfill an order. I can't fill an order. I have no tea. Oh, fine. I'll just move instead. But so it is so interesting with what you're deciding. First of all, you can't just do whatever action you want. You have to have the card for it. And then what you decide to do, the, they get to do the other portion of that card. It's like, do I want to do that? This game was so good. I loved it. I loved it so much. It was great. It looks amazing. It was so satisfying to play. And that's why it's my number three, Sail On. Yeah, this is an awesome game, actually. I've only played it two player, but I look forward to playing it three player because I believe it is only a two or three player game. Um, Isn't it? I thought it was up to four. Because there's only three sections, right? No, I know there's four section. Is there really? Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. So there's four section. And oh, then it's because okay. it's neat. Like there's different goals you can do. So the first one to yeah. build in each section gets the ability. And then there's yeah. like the area control aspect. If you have the most crop in one section, you get that benefit. And it's yeah. a it's a good game. And it's this is one that we've gotten from our Bianca, like our liquid. Yeah, from the discount store. Like nine bucks. Yeah. What? I know Cherry has this game and I keep looking when I go there. I'm like, should I own it too? Yes. <laughs> because it's Everybody mine, should. You should pause this podcast and run over and go get it yeah. because it's so good. It's it is good so game. good. Yeah. 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 It's awesome. Good choice. <laughs> All right. My number three is the last of my Uwe Rosenberg games. And that is Fields of Arl made in 2014. And this one is a two player only game. Can be played with three with the expansion, which I don't have which I would love to get. It's like a tea and trade expansion. <laughs> so if anyone has that expansion and wants to let go of it, let me know. <laughs> but the two player, just the base game is awesome. It has this huge board with tons of worker placement spots. And you have two seasons that you go back and forth, summer, winter, summer, winter. I think you go four times in each one, I believe. But so on the left-hand side are all the worker placement spots for like summer and then the winter is on the right. Some of them are the same, like you can do the same things. And you can always once per round do one action in the other season, but then that gives the other player the first player marker, which can be very important sometimes because there might be something you need to do first before they choose it. Now, what you're doing is you also have this board in front of you and you were building all these different crops, animals, and you were trying to remove these dikes and they are blocking all the fields that you're trying to plant or um, have uh, like fields for animals. There can, it is neat because the animals can go, I think it's on the dikes. You can put them all over. So your board looks so funny at the end because you have these random animals like completely scattered all over. Um, another neat thing is you have these, all these different um, resources that you can upgrade and they will flip over to a better 
thing. So like brick, um, well, no, I guess it's clay will become brick. Um, wood will become, or is it, I forget what, how, what wood flips over to just like some sort of building wood. Maybe wood doesn't flip, but then you have like uh, things like, uh, and, uh, like a pelt will flip over to a coat or something. And then you can deliver these things. So you can ship them out, which is neat because you need vehicles. So you have to buy these vehicles and you have to have space in your vehicle for them, but then you ship them out. But then when you ship them out, you take that tile and you put it on your board and it kind of goes up in this line and it creates points at the end of the game, which is really neat. It's kind of a a unique mechanism in this game. There's also different um, fields and, and end game scoring tiles that you can draft that will, depending what you do, will give you more points. You need to upgrade workers on your actual, like on the actual worker placement board so that in order to go to some spot, instead of getting one wood, you'll get way more wood if you have more axes. So you need to upgrade those tools, which is neat. It's, such a good game. Like I, I can't even say enough about this one. It's so unique. Like all of it, all the ones I've listed other than Caverna and Agricola, which have a similarity, they're all so different. They're all farming, but they're all so different. But that's my number three fields of Arl. Nice. Yeah. That one was cool. Mm -hmm. Um, my number two is key flower which I kind of started playing through the key series. I've only played two so far, but this one is still my favorite. It was created in 2012 by Sebastian Blensdale and Richard Breeze. And the, just the mechanism in here is, is so interesting. And for so far, what I'm seeing with the key series, they're all so different from each other. So mm -hmm. I'm excited to try the other ones, but with this one here, um, it's the bidding mechanism that's, most unique so every player has a little shield and it's built like a house like you look in there and then you could see there's like the little windows and you could see what's on <laughs> like it's it's the attention to detail is amazing so you have your little shield that's your little house uh and then you have meeples which are your workers and you draw from the back so you have different meeples that are going to be into your little house you keep that secret because they're going to be out of three different color either they are yellow blue or red and that's gonna really matter as you play and then you go through and you play the different rounds so you start with a spring so you have your spring tiles that's going to be flipped over and then that's what's available this round and that's what you're going to bid to to own because you start with your little village tile that you start and then you're building like the countryside um so be like okay well i want this one and this one generates this good so then I'm going to bid on it so I'm going to put let's say take a blue meeple and the way like the tiles are all put into the same way and then the flat edge that faces me represents that if I'll put my blue meeple on that flat flat edge of that tile that faces me to show that I'm the one bidding on that and then next player is like well I want that one too so I'm going to put two blue meeple because now that I've assigned a collar to that tile, if you want to do anything with that tile, you have to do it in blue meeples. So if you don't have blue meeples, you're kind of out of luck here. So I was like, well, I have some blue meeples. I'll put two blue meeples so that I can outbid you. So if anybody else wants to come, they'd have to put three blue, uh, blue meeples in order to be able to outbid all of us. Now, if it comes to my turn again, I can reallocate that blue meeple since it's been outbid to either bid on another tile or maybe it was like, well, that's really annoying because I really wanted this, but I'll just take my blue meeple and I'll put on the tile and activate what it does and collect that resource right now. Because uh, you can activate the tiles even before they're owned as well so at the end of the round then all the winning bids like you take the tile that you want and you add this to your little village so you're building these tile like placing these tile creating your village as you go as well um and then you'll have different things where it's like okay well this one will generate this good but if i get those goods over at this tile i can upgrade this tile which is going to give me more points so you're kind of careful on how you're building this as well and then when you're placed so in the next round you have all the tiles for the summer that's on the shelf that you can, um, on the table that you can bid on 
or activate, but you also have the tiles in the village that you can send your workers to to activate as well. Um, and I can send my worker and activate the tile in the other player's village also. So it's like, well, that tile that you outbid me on that I wanted to activate and I got to activate it the one time, I'm going to go and activate it again and put my worker on it. So now if the person who owns it is like, well, I wanted to activate it <laughs> and now you put the yellow meeple on it. So they can go and activate it as, again, but they have to send two yellow meeple to do that action now. Um, and the good thing about it for them is like, okay, I've put my meeple on your village. At the end of the round, all those meeples that are on the tiles in your village goes in your house. And all the vil the meeples that I've activated on the tiles that we're bidding on, if you win that tile, you get the meeple that's on it as well. So you can build your, you get more meeples. Um, because each round there's a boat that has meeples and goods and stuff on it. So you would kind of pick a boat and you get those meeples and put that into, you know. So you're trying to get the most meeple because it gives you more bidding power. And then having the most different color gives you more control over that as well. And there's also one tile that allows you to trade meeples for green meeples. And these green meeples, they're very hard to get. And the big benefit of that is if I'm going to bid with the green meeple... It's going to be hard to outbid me because did you get any green maples? If you did it, you can't touch this tile. That tile is all mine, <laughs> right? So you get that benefit of this. This game is so rich. There's just so much going on with it, with the bidding and the kind of building your village and all this stuff. Um, if you're playing with people that, like, there's a lot to consider. So AP can be a big problem with this. And then also because you can activate tiles on other people, that really messes with the plan. It can feel a little take that. And I know that's been an issue with some people. Um, but I just love this game. That's my number two, Key Flower. Yeah, that is such a good game. All right, my next two, I feel like one of them might be your number one. <laughs> I'm not 100%, but maybe. My number two is La Granja. La Granja, made in 2014 by Michael Keller and Andres Odi Odendal. This one I had just received a month-ish ago, my Grand Master, Deluxe Master set, and it's so beautiful. I had this game before and I loved it, but I did sell it because I had kickstarted this one. Such a good game. It's multi card or multi use cards in the best way. You use every side of the card the top, the right, the left, the bottom. You are, you have a player board in front of you. If you place the card on the top, it is a market that you're trying to fulfill. If you place it on the right, it is a farm upgrade. If you place it on the bottom, it's um, an ability. If you place it on the left, it is like a crop or field. Um, you are trying to fulfill contracts um, to the market or just to on the board. I forget what they're called now, but they're um, different types of things that you're fulfilling, but you're trying to get, say, like a whole bunch of coins. And once you get that, you get to place a little income bonus onto your board. Then you also get to choose which one to open up because not all of them are open yet. You are connecting, um, there's a little area control thing going on, which is cool because you, when you fulfill one from your board, you get to place however high value that was, you get to place on there. And if I put a five and around me were some threes and fours that people already placed, you knock them off. So the higher you place, then no one can ever knock you off of there. There's so much going on. The the money, oh, you're getting these roof tiles that you can all buy each round and they will go onto your little roof that you have on your player board and they give you a little bonus and points at the end of the game. The It's a dice drafting game. So you're, the, you're drafting dice that are all in these worker placement spots to use as actions. And then the last one there, everybody gets to do. So you sometimes will do some hate drafting. You'll just do stuff you need. But if you don't need anything that's there, you might take something that somebody else really needs. You're going up this um, siesta track that will decide player order but also give you points and with some of these um one of the expansions that came in the new one it's really cool because you can upgrade those um your donkey tiles which these donkey tiles you will um each will choose at the end of each round in order to how many deliveries you're going to use 
Now, these upgrades are really cool because they give you multiple more deliveries or you can move up the track a lot faster and you get to use them. Um, you could use them up to twice per game, I believe, because you get to reset them halfway through the game. So if you get it early, you'll get to use it twice in the game. There's so much going on in the game and the little expansions that come with it are just awesome. And you can just throw one in or a couple, but it's such an awesome game. I love it. And that's my number two, La Granja. Nice. My number one is La Granja as well. It. It's <laughs> yeah, it's, you know what? It's so good. So created in 2014, like you said, by Michael Keller and Andreas O.D. Odendal. Um, I have the original version. That's the one I had bought. I was sitting on my shelf of shame. I just played it last couple of weeks here for the first time. Um, over the weekend, Kayla and Travis were over and we played it. And <laughs> it's so good. so good. Oh my God, it's so good. So you have your player board. What's really neat with the player board, you have these cutout areas. Yeah. So at the top, you have like the cutout thing. And if you decide you're going to do uh, fulfilling the order with your card, then you slide the card down into it so that what shows now is what the order is and what you get for it. And it's like, okay, so then that just slides right in there. Or there's a main part of the card that has like your special worker and each one gives you a special ability. And if you decide to do that, and there's three slots on the bottom that you can put, slide these card under, and then it shows what the special ability is. Or if you slide it onto the left side of the board and you kind of go over then what's sticking out there is the different field that you can start collecting crops for. And now you have that showing on the side, or you can go and add to your farm where you get more pigs, uh, p um, pens, or you get like uh, different, uh, more money that you can kind of bring in. And oh my God, I was so impressed. I was so impressed. Just that, that alone with the multi-use cards is amazing. Then once you've done that and you go to the action, because you have all these different actions you can do. There's six different actions, but you have all these dice. You roll the dice and that's what's going to be available. Say, like, okay, great. I need, really need to get pigs, which is a number one action. No one got rolled. You're not getting pigs this round. That's not enough. Like, it's just so <laughs> neat as to what is it. Okay, well, fine. I'll get the money. Oh, there's only one of them. Oh, my God. I hope nobody takes that. And then, oh, no, Travis took it. Well, I guess I'm not doing that. You know, so it's so neat and satisfying, like, how this haul comes together. And then you're delivering some of the goods to fulfill the like the building so that you get the benefit of that building and you get like you want to be there first because you get the bonus victory points for if you're the first one there um and you know like but yeah you have like the whole donkey so it's like okay well i can't deliver everything um <laughs> what do i want to try to do so i'm going to try to do that first you know so it's 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 neat it is interesting the three of us were just so blown away by this game it was so good Oh, my none of you one. had played it before? No. We were oh, this was awesome. all a first time playing it and yeah. <laughs> it was so good. Yeah. So good. Oh my god. So that's number one, La Granja. Awesome. Yeah, I thought that would be on your list for sure. That's why I mm. thought if she hasn't said it yet, it must be coming. Yeah. All right. So my number one, do you have any guesses? Hmm. Uh -huh. I'm not <laughs> sure. It's Vidiculture, oh, made in 2013 by Jamie yes. Stegmaier and Alan Stone. I love yes. this game. I, it's one of my favorite games, and I think it'll always be in my collection. Every time I think about it, I want to play it. It's so fun. It's You are um, growing grapevines, and then you are harvesting them and turning them into wine. And how you do that is worker placement spots, and you go through seasons, if you have the expansion of Tuscany, you have four seasons that you get to go through and each season you will place workers. And then once you pass, you wait until the next season, until everybody's in it, and then you will start again. So you were doing things like um, building buildings that you might need in order to plant grapes because you might need these little, um, uh, what are they called now? I forget what they're called, but they're two little buildings that you sometimes need to, to plant certain grapes. Sometimes you don't. 
you need to upgrade your um, seller. So you might have to upgrade like to the third level. There's three levels of it. You can build windmills that will um, give you points, I think, throughout the game. You can build a yoke that will let you harvest your own crops and not having to go to a worker placement spot, which can be really hard to get to sometimes because especially in a two-player game, only one person can take each spot. So it gets tricky. Um, when you do plant grapes and harvest them, you take these little glass beads and you put them on these little um, grape counters. And then each round they will, um, uh, what do they call it? They, they uh, Like age? Not age. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say the upgrade. No, that's not it. They age. <laughs> or if you've turned it into wine, then you have your cellar and you move those glass beads over. So if I had a four level grape, I would move it to a four level red wine. And then those will um, age as well at the end of the round, which is really neat. Then you're fulfilling contracts of wine as well. You can um, you have three fields that you can plant grapes. You can actually sell a field to get some money because you need money to upgrade your buildings or to build buildings. You um, there's card play in it too, which is really cool because some of them can let you um, add more workers very cheap, whereas they're normally like four or five dollars, which is quite expensive at the beginning of the game. But you only start with three, I believe, so you can get up to six, which is helpful because in each round you have six workers to place instead of three, so you can get so much more completed. Mm. You have this grande worker, which is a bigger meeple that he can go even if somebody else is there. Which is awesome because in the base game, I don't think he was there. So it was very tricky getting around. Um, once you fulfill contracts, you get to have um, residual income. So it gives you money each round. And you're just trying to get the most points. But once someone reaches, I believe it's 25 points, that triggers the end of the game. And then everyone finishes that round and whoever has the most points wins. He has just come out recently in the last year, maybe even two, um, a co-op version of this game, which is very hard. We finally, third time, third time we've tried, completed the, um, it's not even the beginner version. It was the introductory that came with the game. It was just a little bonus pack. It took us three times to actually beat that one. So now we're just going on to the <laughs> normal game, but it's quite thinky that one, but it's so fun, but you can competitive or cooperative. It's such an awesome game. I love this game. I love the designer and just his whole theory of, you know, he's just trying to make good games and, and bring people into it. And he's also trying to um, uplift other designers and, like he never has a negative thing to say about anything. It's always just positive. He he will draw, he will have YouTube videos of just talking about other people's games. And he designs several games, but he also, he um, backs other games like in his production company from other designers. But then he talks about completely other designers and production companies as well. He's got a very good business model. And I'll always be looking at his games when they come out. I don't always like all his games or love all his games, but this one is my favorite farming game for sure. And that's Viticulture. My yeah, and you know one. a Stonemaier game is going to be good production game. Oh, yeah. Guaranteed. Yeah. Um, this one did not make my list because I forgot to put it on my list. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, like, it's oh, like, yeah, Viticulture. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops, but yeah, no, amazing game. I just love how you get like the summer action and then afterwards the winter action or the yeah. fall action. And it's like, okay, I want to do this, but you can't use them all because then yeah. otherwise you won't have any to, it's like, you, it's such an interesting decision. Okay, mm -hmm. do I do more or do I stop and save them for the next round, like for the next yeah. set of actions? So, so satisfying, yeah. great game. Oh yeah, and there's there's one little expansion that has special workers that some of them can jump into the future and do oh. like an action, <laughs> or they can go back into the past, which is neat. Or they neat. can like there's all kind of kinds of things they can do, which helps. Yeah, but yeah, no, it's awesome. So satisfying. Right. Game. So that was our top nine farm theme games. We had lots of chat on that one. Yeah. <laughs> um. Next week, we are going to, or uh, our next episode, we are going to be talking about our top nine games better than Scrabble. 
Um, yeah. We both do love uh, word games. Mm-hmm. I probably get to play more of them than you. Yeah. Like you said, your family is in a love of word they, games. They but. don't. Well, you know, so my, if, if you look at my siblings, um, we learned English. So it's French learning English. So if we play games and then I've, I've kind of. So I have a bit of an advantage. I, like, I would say I'm like the most bilingual, uh, you know, so when it comes to oh, word yeah. stuff a little bit. My brother, maybe not. My brother probably. Mind you, my brother just make up words that don't exist. So. <laughs> you should play Boulder Dash with him then. <laughs> <laughs> we always play with a dictionary nearby. If we can't find the definite, it's, does it, like, it doesn't yeah. exist. You're vetoed. But um, mm-hmm. but my my family would pl- place... Um, boggle quite a bit growing up but my my kids um yeah in french oh yeah um so um yeah but then with my kids if we play word games i just because i think we played boggle so much looking for words and stuff that i would find like five words to their one so they're like we don't want to play with you (laughs) (laughs) yeah that's so (laughs) It's like, okay i'll close my eyes for the first five seconds then i'll start (laughs) (laughs) but yeah yeah so top nine games better than scrabble for the next episode i'm excited to put that list together Mm -hmm. yeah there's a lot i love word games Mm -hmm. okay but until then where could people find you if they want to contact you? so first be sure to check out our discord and we'll add a link and every time we have to add a new link i don't know why discord links expires it's Mm, so weird. weird but be sure to check out our discord uh we have great discussions on there uh on youtube my youtube channel is mal's board game room uh instagram it's mal's underscore board game underscore room and my facebook group is mal's board game room how about you carla where can we find you i'm on instagram at board game specialist all one word and I also have a Facebook page called Red Deer Board Game Fanatics, but I just wanted to say one thing. I'm not sure if some people are friend request friend requesting me instead of going onto my page because I won't accept you if I don't have a clue what it's about. <laughs> but if you do go send on, a message, like <laughs> send a message on my board game page, because then maybe I would. I don't know if just it's just random people. I think everybody gets that. Oh, yeah. Some random. But I sometimes wonder, are these board game people? And I'm just not accepting them. But I won't accept someone if I don't have a clue what who they are or what. I do that too. Like, to oh, to board me. game people, instant yes. <laughs> yeah, for sure I would. Yeah. Friend, automatic friend. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, you're my friend. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, until next time, you guys all have a great day and thanks for listening. Bye, everybody.